dear friends a very good evening to all of you uh, let's first start by welcoming two of our speakers today dr uday bundugula and professor vishwanathan so i'd like to welcome all of you for back to back talks again this is the sixth edition of the big data public lecture series uh, so today the two talks will be given by uh, dr uday bundugula and professor vishwanathan uh, let me very briefly introduce uh, dr uday for you uh, he is currently an assistant professor at the department of computer science and automation and his research 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 interests are in paralyzing compilers and runtime systems for a variety of uh, uh, high speed architectures like multi cores uh, he is also looking at uh, accelerator architectures and he is also looking into distributed clusters and so on and uh, before joining the department uh, three and a half years back uh, he was actually working at the ibm tj watson research center in the in the advanced compiler technology lab and uh, before joining the ibm watson research center he was at the ohio state uh, university doing his phd and before ohio state university he was at uh, iit madras uh, btech in computer science so today we have a very bright uh, uh, young assistant professor from csa speaking to us and he will be talking to us today about uh, scalable programming technologies for uh, big data applications let's invite uh, dr uday with a wide applause Good afternoon, everyone, and uh, uh, thanks, Professor Narahari, for the uh, introduction and the kind words. So uh, this talk is on uh, scalable programming technologies and architectures for big data. And so my, the content of my talk has been uh, influenced by uh, many of the talks in this, uh, many of the previous talks in this seminar series. And as most of you know, uh, Many of the previous talks were about algorithms, right? Uh, what kind of algorithms are useful for big data? But this talk is slightly different. It's for uh, programming technologies. And so if you already have an algorithm, or if you would like to design an algorithm for big data, right? how would you design it so that you get uh, good performance? Right? That's one thing. Another way to look at it is, if you already have an algorithm, uh, how would you implement it efficiently? so that uh, you are able to get uh, good results in a reasonable amount of time. So, so since this is going to be a bit practical, it's uh, important to state the assumptions here. And so what is uh, big data? So in the previous talks, it was almost clear to me that big data is a, it's a, it's a very vague notion. So we really need to state uh, the assumptions here. So I'm going to assume that you say you have big data if the data cannot be analyzed on a small number of nodes, or a single node, or a small number of nodes. So what I mean by a node is it's a system which has maybe several cores, but it sh has shared memory. Okay, So a server or a workstation that has several cores, right, maybe eight cores or 16 cores, and it has a shared memory, is a single node. Okay, It could potentially have accelerators. But uh, the point is, different nodes, when you have different nodes, they are all interconnected in some way, and each node has its own uh, shared memory. Okay, and so if you have so much data that you cannot, you cannot potentially analyze it in a reasonable amount of time uh, with a small number of nodes, you say that you have big data, and so that's where uh, the connection between big data and parallelism comes in. And so if you want to handle big data, you have to exploit uh, parallelism. Okay? Or else uh, big data would just end up being uh, slow, slow data. So the assumption is that data is distributed across uh, different nodes. 
these nodes could just be interconnected and they can be in a large room like this one or maybe the nodes are uh, geographically uh, uh, apart right and so this is this also gives us the connection between big data and hpc so hpc is high performance computing and so this is uh, the area that uses uh, supercomputers mainly scientists and engineers from physics chemistry they use uh, supercomputers for long running applications so it's uh, interesting to see these two different uh, angles so in that domain uh, of scientific computing big data has already been uh, used i mean you have large amounts of data and big data is one of the reasons why we have large uh, supercomputers so so there are these two different ways uh, the two different domains that require hpc when you have the traditional hpc the scientists they typically have a hypothesis or a mathematical model and they want to use uh, simulation to make predictions on observations right and so they use hpc they need uh, high compute power but then they already have a mathematical model they have a hypothesis that they want to uh, maybe refute or they want to validate or they want to motivate their theory and they use simulation now another angle many of you are looking at uh, big data have been thinking about hadoop and uh, data analysis data analytics and data mining where you may not necessarily have a strong hypothesis but you have all this data and you want to do something with it and you want to uh, deduce something from it and so so it's interesting to see these two different uh, uh, ways in which big data is being uh, used and both of these approaches would require high compute power because parallelism is uh, important but there are these two different uh, so what i'm going to focus on in this talk is applicable to both okay so uh, before i get to uh, the main content uh, let me just uh, quickly uh, go over some a few concepts that many of you in hpc high performance computing might already be familiar with it so so we have something we call we have something called scaling that is you run something on one processor right and then you run it on let's say n processors and if you see a speed up of n it's called ideal scaling some people call it linear scaling or it's called ideal scaling you see a speed of more of more than n then it's uh, super ideal scaling or it can be less as as well so so it's when you look at scaling there are two things right when you run it in parallel and then you see good speed ups that's good but you should also be sure that you're getting good single thread performance right so someone runs it on 100 cores and gets a speed up of 100 right but if his single thread performance is 100 times worse than a good optimized single thread uh, application then you are just wasting lot of compute power you are wasting lot of power and running it on 100 nodes but you are just getting uh, the performance of a single uh, single thread application so it's uh, important to do optimize your single thread and then all actually scale uh, well right now if you try to look at uh, if you focus on this question uh, why do you need a more powerful machine so there are two reasons so these we call this strong scaling and weak scaling so strong scaling we say strong scaling when you want to run the same problem faster okay so you have a problem and then you buy a bigger machine let's say it's uh, two times the size and your goal or, and your only goal is to run the same problem two times faster so that's strong scaling and the weak scaling is you buy a bigger machine and all you want to do is run a larger problem size right two times the problem size in the same amount of time okay so uh, there are some applications and some scientists who want strong scaling some want weak scaling so both of these are important it really depends on your application and uh, you say you have ideal weak scaling when you are able to you buy a bigger machine you run a larger problem size in the same amount of time so that's ideal weak scaling ideal strong scaling would be you buy a machine that's two times the size and your execution time reduces by 2 okay and now let's uh, data scaling is a form of uh, weak scaling so i'm just introducing this term here for the purpose of this talk where you will try to use as much memory as you have so if you buy if you have a large system with 1000 nodes you will try to run a problem such that the main memory on each of those nodes right the ram on each of the nodes is used okay and if you give them a bigger machine they'll try to again use the main memory so this is a data scaling again it's a form of uh, weak scaling and it sort of the combined memory capacity of all of these nodes sort of limits 
the size of the problem that you can handle. And we see that weak scaling and data scaling are uh, really important. And so let me just quickly uh, show this in a graph. So this is strong scaling. When you see a strong scaling graph, you'll see number of cores on the x-axis. And on the y-axis, you'll see execution time. As you increase the number of cores, your execution time should go down. Okay? And then uh, this is a weak scaling, where you have number of cores, number of processes on this. But as you increase the number of processes, you also increase the problem size. So if you see a flat execution time here, right, it means it's really good. So for a larger problem size, on a larger number of processes, you're able to run in the same amount of time. Whereas these two graphs, right, these two graphs indicate that the weak scaling has been uh, very poor. That is, uh, you would expect it to run in the same amount of time because you're adding more process, but then it's taking more time. So this one here is ideal weak scaling. And many experts believe that weak scaling is the main reason why we have very large supercomputers. Because if you take the same problem size and keep on adding more and more compute power, what really happens is uh, the compute time on each node will go on decreasing, which basically means you will be communication bandwidth bound. Right? There will be lots of uh, small messages. Uh, but what really drives uh, supercomputing is uh, larger problem sizes. So people want bigger supercomputers because they want to run uh, bigger problem sizes and not that they want to run the same problem size uh, faster. Okay. So in this sense, we'll see that big data is a really a strong motivating uh, domain for HPC as well because uh, you want to run, you want to use a lot of data and so it basically will drive uh, server computing as well. So now I want to highlight the importance of uh, the problem of data movement. So when you have big data, you also have to move big data. Right? So if you, have, if you are analyzing data in parallel, right, once you do this analysis, there will be phases where you have to communicate. And large amounts of data has to be uh, moved. So if you want to get uh, good performance, it's absolutely essential that you design algorithms or you implement algorithms in a way that minimizes movement of data. And communication arises naturally as a result of data dependencies. That is, if you have some piece of computation right, that produces results that are used by another piece of computation, and these two pieces of computation are executing on different nodes, you have this communication. So it arises naturally as a result of data dependencies. Irrespective of the programming model used, so MPI is message passing interface, right, where the programmer explicitly passes messages. Uh, for example, something like MapReduce, Many of you are familiar with uh, data analytics and have used MapReduce. You have a map function and a reduce function. Here, communication sort of hap happens uh, within the runtime. So you have a map function that produces lots of uh, key value pairs. And then you have a reduce function, which takes all those key value pairs, which have the same key, and then does something. So there is a hidden shuffle operation inside the MapReduce implementation that will bring together all the key value pairs, which have the same key, to a particular uh, reduce node. Okay. So, so there is a very complex communication hidden behind. So it is uh, irrespective of the programming model you use, uh, it's uh, absolutely essential uh, that you, the communication is minimized, whether it's in the runtime, in the library, or it's by the programmer. And if you don't get your communication computation ratio correct, you will not see good performance. OK, so let, let me give you some uh, concrete uh, numbers to highlight this uh, and how our architectures have been evolving. So if you look at the compute speed, right? So by compute speed, I mean the sheer uh, compute capacity of today's chips, right? So the latest chips, for example, can perform four multiply adds per cycle. And each cycle is, if you say, 3 gigahertz, right? each cycle is uh, 0 0.3 nanoseconds, roughly. And so if you can perform uh, four multiply adds per cycle, and it means four eight double precision values, so that's eight times eight, 64 bytes every 0 0.3 nanoseconds. And if you just calculate, right, 64 bytes in every 0 0.3 nanoseconds, so it's roughly about 180 gigabytes per second. There is no way the chip has so much memory bandwidth. So the only way you can keep your pipeline full is if you have all the data in your cache or registers. So that's the only way you will be able to make uh, full use of your compute resources. That basically says how fast compute is and 
uh, how far behind memory bandwidth is. So unless your data is in the caches or in the registers, you are never going to be able to realize uh, the, the peak compute speed. And what you see today is just a fraction of that peak speed. There are only some applications that are able to get to the get to 95% or 99% of uh, this compute speed. Okay. So that's for compute. And now synchronization. So what do I mean by synchronization? So when you run uh, several things in parallel or multiple cores, right? And then if you want one core to see the results of another core, right? You place a synchronization call. Let's say you have eight cores running in parallel, and then you place a barrier, right? And then uh, after the barrier, another core will be able to see the results of it. Right? So if you don't have, there are codes where you don't need any synchronization, and each thread can just go and do its work. But typically, you need uh, synchronization. And uh, I ran, for example, the uh, OpenMP benchmarks, which actually uh, times uh, finds out the time taken by synchronization. It almost takes uh, 0.25 microseconds to synchronize between two cores, because you'll have to at least get to L3 cache, because L1, L2 is private. So whatever. So the synchronization takes. Uh, and then if you have a larger system with 16 cores, the synchronization takes 1.54 microseconds. So what I want to say is, uh, emphasize is the difference between this and this. Uh, your compute, right, uh, if you're performing four operations in 0.3 nanoseconds, and there's an order of 1,000 difference between the synchronization times and the compute times. So which basically means if you want to parallelize something, you better perform at least thousands of operations before you synchronize. Okay, so what you need is a coarse grained uh, parallelism. Otherwise, you're not going to see any uh, speed up. So whenever you see all your cores busy and they're doing work, but still you don't see any speed up, it's because they're just uh, synchronizing too frequently or the memory bandwidth is just not enough to keep all of them busy. Okay, so it basically means you want to at least uh, perform thousands of operations before you actually synchronize, so as to hide these delays. And now that was memory and compute. And now if you look at uh, hard disks, so current hard disks, are, for example, the best hard disks give you roughly 140 uh, megabytes per second. So that's already uh, almost. So the memory bandwidth is going to be 10 to 20 gigabytes per second. And so you almost have a 10x difference between these two. And uh, many of these network cards that are connected to PCI Express have an 8 gigabytes per second. And uh, there are better, uh, better storage technologies these days. They're still expensive. These are solid state drives, right? Uh, which provide much higher bandwidth than hard disks. So it's uh, getting better, and they can give even a few gigabytes per second. And then once you interconnect nodes, right, as I mentioned, the assumption is that a node has shared memory, and then you have your data distributed across uh, several of these uh, nodes. Right? So you have to communicate between the, these nodes. And the, the best interconnects right, give you these kind of latencies. So point-to-point -point latency, sending a small message from one node to another node can take 1.2 microseconds. And the bandwidth you get is uh, you can get up to 6.25 gigabytes per second for large messages. So you can almost try to compare these. You'll see that this is already much faster than hard disks. So it's better to get data from the network than getting it from the hard disk. Uh, SSDs make it better, but again, they are uh, expensive. So, and then. If you look at a fiber optic network link, right, uh, you connect two nodes that are far apart. So this is the kind of bandwidth you get, 38.4 gigabits per second. That is roughly uh, slightly less than this. This is in gigabytes per second. So and then sometimes you have so much data, right? it might be better to just put all the data in a truck and send it. And that might give you more bandwidth then. So the reason uh, I'm emphasizing this is, so there's this bandwidth and this latency. So when you have your data distributed across a large number of nodes, the amount of computation you'll do on a node may be small. And so your message sizes are going to be sm small. So the latency is also important. So you may not be able to use, uh, for some applications, maybe you cannot use nodes that are far apart, because just because the latency is going to be too high, and you may not be able to uh, parallelize efficiently. So what we are going to assume is, so I believe this is a reasonable model. That is, you have all the data that you want to analyze. You have it on multiple nodes. But all of those nodes are sort of close together, tightly coupled, and maybe, let's say, in a room of this size. And you have excellent bandwidth and latency. Right? And uh, for most applications, perhaps this is a sort of a reasonable uh, architecture to expect good performance on. 
maybe when you don't have as much communication, even this is going to work. That is, you have few nodes, uh, maybe across different continents, and you, all your big data is spread across those nodes. And maybe the communication is not so much, and the latency is not important, that you can actually use uh, uh, high latency links. So uh, with this, as I mentioned, because of this entire hierarchy that you see, all the way from uh, here, memory bandwidth to uh, to the network latencies, right? This microsecond and nanosecond difference. Uh, it's absolutely important to exploit locality. So, what is locality? So, you say you exploit locality when you perform many operations, as many operations as possible, on the data that you bring into a faster level of memory. So, you bring in data into a cache, and then you try to reorder your computation such that you will uh, perform as many operations as possible on this data that's in your uh, faster memory. It could be caches, it could be registers, it could be main memory. Okay, so so the goal is to uh, reduce communication as much as possible. It'll also give you better single thread performance and uh, reduce communication. So big data in that sense is uh, it's, it's no different from what we have been doing with high performance computing all these days. Uh, that is. We all know that exploiting locality is important, and the same principles are going to hold true for big data, except that if you don't do this, uh, the, the effects or the bad effects are going to be uh, even severe. Right? And at the same time, uh, current architectures have wider and wider SIMDs these days. That is, uh, earlier, starting 2000s, we saw multi-core architectures. That is, saw two cores, four cores, eight cores. And now it's sort of uh, stabilized there. And then architects are now trying to make the SIMD units wider and wider. So we had 128-bit SIMD for a long time. Those, those, those were the SSC multimedia extensions. And uh, these days, now we have 256-bit uh, SIMD units in uh, Intel process, for example. And uh, even accelerators have 512-bit SIMD. So if you're not going to use uh, the SIMD units efficiently, again, you lose a lot of performance. You may see good scaling, but your single thread performance is going to be uh, very bad. So you cannot uh, neglect uh, any opportunities you have to vectorize your code. So as I said, there are two ways uh, to go about this. Right? You, can design, you can design new algorithms. It's completely change your algorithm to suit, to avoid communication maybe, and design it specifically for big data. Right? Or uh, you can uh, take an existing algorithm and reorder the computations in that algorithm so as to uh, avoid communication or exploit locality. So uh, let me now go to the, uh, the main part of this uh, talk, which is on uh, programming for big data. That is, you have an algorithm in mind, and you have a problem to solve. Hopefully, you will get some hints on how to efficiently implement it, right? uh, all the way from what languages to use Right, what tools, what libraries, and what packages to use for that particular problem. So I'm just going to give you a high-level uh, overview. Right? There are lots of different domains. Different problems require different uh, programming models. But uh, hopefully, you'll get uh, some idea. So I'm going to list the different uh, approaches that you can uh, take if you want to uh, solve a particular problem. So the first is just you spend a lot of time, write it in C or C++, and that will give you the best uh, performance. So the disadvantage is you really have to spend a lot of time not using any libraries, but trying to optimize it yourself. And so this may not be uh, the best approach, but you will pro potentially uh, get a lot of opportunity to optimize. So you can just use uh, C sort of the language uh, these days to get uh, good performance. People no longer use assembly that much except in uh, very specific domains. And uh, you could use programming models like OpenMP, CUDA, MPI, uh, MapReduce. Right? And then uh, you'll spend a lot of time trying to optimize these, but you will likely get uh, excellent uh, performance. Okay? But really, the problem here is productivity. It's not very easy to program uh, big applications using this. You want to be able to use uh, libraries and other higher levels of abstraction. Now, the second uh, common approach is a library-based approach. That is, someone provides you a nice package which has uh, highly tuned routines. right? And you just write your program as a sequence of those library calls. Typically, a single library call won't solve the problem for you. So you have to compose this in some way. 
And uh, so this is, uh, you could use that in conjunction, conjunction with many languages like C, C++, Python, and so on. And then you can also use uh, higher level languages with abstractions like uh, object-oriented programming, Java. Right? And then uh, there are also these ultra high level languages like uh, R, MATLAB. And the problem really with these languages is that uh, the single routines that they provide are highly tuned. But when you actually compose all of these routines together, it's no longer optimal. Because each of those routines is optimal, but there are opportunities to optimize uh, across these routines. And the compiler sees these uh, functions as black boxes, and it knows nothing about the semantics. And so the resulting application that you may get may no longer be the, the best one. So that's the problem. So, but these languages are great for prototyping. They'll uh, really speed up prototyping. You can get a correct working version. But once you want to run it on larger pieces of data, then people who program in MATLAB frequently encounter this problem. Uh, they, they prototype it fairly quickly. But then if they want performance, they end up rewriting it. In, in some other language. Okay, so that's the. So, the fifth bullet I have here is this is where uh, there's a lot of uh, research opportunity, right? If you try to build something, a new domain specific language, along with a compiler and a runtime for it, you can potentially provide the kind of productivity of these high level languages while providing the performance of uh, uh, manual uh, C programming. So, because when you have a domain specific uh, language, you can really exploit uh, the domain information. That is, you really know a lot about what each of the library routine does or each of the basic building block does. And so the compiler can potentially optimize across all of these. And it can generate a highly optimized uh, code that may sometimes even beat uh, manually developed code. So in that sense, uh, there's a lot of research opportunity here. And I'm going to show you an example which actually shows this difference. That is, uh, you try to write it with libraries, and then uh, you try to actually use a compiler to select a globally optimal solution across these different routines, uh, and then you can see the results in the difference in performance. So as I mentioned, it's always a productivity performance trade-off. When you get productivity, you, don't, uh, you may not get performance, and vice versa. And uh, as I said, the tune libraries can perform very well, but only for those specific routines, but not across all of these. And composing these, the libraries can't potentially provide you all combinations of these routines. So that would be uh, infeasible. And as I said, uh, the ultra level, uh, high level languages are good for prototyping, but not probably. They, they discard basic optimizations that probably give very good uh, performance. So we need everything. We want to be able to perform the traditional compiler optimizations and at the same time uh, provide something good for the programmer. So here's uh, a motivating example. Uh, you don't have to understand all of this code. I'll just quickly explain the basic. So this is a sequence of uh, a linear algebra calls. Okay, The ones in capitals are matrices. The lower case are vectors. So A and B are matrices. So you are performing some uh, inner products here, right? vector products. And then you are performing a matrix vector multiply here. And there is another matrix vector multiply here. So th these pieces are, th these two computations are, they involve order and square operations because it's a matrix that's being multiplied with a vector, right? So these are all uh, vector additions here. Even here, you have order and square. So let's just focus on this and this, okay? So here, the transpose of a matrix is being multiplied with a vector, and here a matrix is being multiplied with a vector. So it's this sequence of uh, uh, four matrix level operations that someone, let's say a scientist, wants to perform. And in C, you would write it like this. This is a two-dimensional loop nest, two-dimensional loop nest. And you have one loop here, and then you have two loops here. Okay, And uh, you can take this. And it's, so it's pretty straightforward to write it down in C. right? And uh, you can just run it through a compiler. And so it, if you just focus on these two, right? this operation multiplies the columns of B with this vector. Okay? And here you multiply the rows of B, it's a, because it's just B times X. So you multiply the rows of B with this vector. So if you try to look at parallelism, right? here the parallelism is along the columns of B. Okay? So each column of B can be multiplied with X in parallel. 
here the parallelism is along the rows of B. Each row of B can be multiplied with X in parallel. So if you have big data, let's say this B has 1 million rows, right, and you have uh, 1,000 processors, you will roughly get 1,000 rows for each processor. Here you will have, you'll need 1,000 columns for each processor. Okay, so here I say, so this is the first loopness. Here there's parallelism along columns, and here there's parallelism along rows. Okay. Sorry, I, I didn't put in alpha and beta, but they are scalars. Okay. They are just uh, constant scalars. So it's uh, beta times B transpose by alpha times. So it's just uh, constants that are no known to the compiler. But the key operation is this, the matrix vector product. OK, now uh, we look at large data that doesn't fit in a single machine. So you want to distribute this across multiple uh, machines. OK, so as you see here, you want to how would you distribute B? Right? B doesn't fit in a single process memory. So you would distribute for the f this loopness, you would like to distribute columns of B across process right, to get parallelism. Whereas here, you would like to distribute rows of B in parallel. So there is this uh, conflicting requirement. So if I do a data distribution, right, I have to select one particular data distribution. I either keep columns, I distribute columns, or I keep uh, rows, or else I'll have to do a transpose in between. Okay? So so for the first loop nest, I need to distribute it this way. So the numbers here indicate processor numbers. There are four processors here. So the first column is with the first processor, second column is the second processor, and so on. So with this, you can parallelize the, that particular matrix vector, multiply the first one very well. Uh, but the second loop nest requires your data to be in this form. That is, uh, the first row should go to the first processor, second row should be. So which basically means Either you lose out on parallelism, you select one of these two layouts, right, distributions, and then you lose out on parallelism for the other one. So you can have it this way. In this case, if you use this layout, you can no longer parallelize the second matrix vector multiply because the data is no longer with you. Okay, so you'll have to run it sequentially, and vice versa. So, but then you want to parallelize both of them. So what you have to do is a transpose. That is, you need a lot of communication uh, to transpose this entire uh, distribution. From a row-wise, you need to go to a column-wise. And so, uh, if some of you are familiar with uh, MPI, so it's, it's called an all-to-all -all communication because uh, this has to be sent to this, two has to be sent here, three has to be uh, sent here. So this block of data has to be sent. So the entire uh, matrix is sort of shuffled and you actually end up getting order n square communication. And if n is big, right, so this is, uh, it's, it's a lot of data. If you believe in the hype of big data, you may end up just sending uh, hard disks in a truck to your to the other node and then say that this part of this is done, now you can do the other matrix vector multiply because uh, there's so much. So uh, it's absolutely essential to reduce this uh, communication right, from order n square. So is it, and so that's the, uh, if you try to do it manually, right, you, that's what you get. But typically, uh, someone, uh, an expert in high performance computing would write it this way. That is, there, is the, there are these blast routines, right? Uh, and Intel and all vendors provide highly optimized libraries for these uh, routines for matrix vector multiply and so on. And so you, this can be, sorry, this can be written just as a, instead of writing C code, you just write a sequence of function calls. So this D copy is copy, uh, DGEMV is the matrix vector multiply. DGEMV is a matrix vector. So this is also reasonably straightforward to get this uh, sequence of library calls. And each library call is highly tuned. So uh, it's uh, hand tuned, and there's, it's very hard to beat these uh, library calls. But when you use this sequence of library calls, you have to select a particular data distribution. And uh, in this case, if you use Intel Scalar Pack, which, is, which provides all these routines, that is distributed memory implementations of these routines, uh, you have to select a fixed distribution for all of your uh, data. So matrix B, you have to say it's block distributed, distributed row-wise, column-wise, or 2D block cyclic, and so on. So you end up with the same problem. You either have load imbalance, that is some of your processors are not busy, right? You lose out on parallelism, or you have uh, communication. So now the goal is, can you do better than order n squared? And it turns out there is a way you can uh, actually do better. This is called a Sudoku style uh, mapping, where you distribute it in a way such that every row 
and every column has exactly one entry for each of the process. Right? So it's same as it's called Sudoku mapping because it's similar to the combinatorial puzzle Sudoku that we have. So instead of trying to get zeros here or zeros here, instead of trying to distribute row-wise or column-wise, I'll distribute it in a way such that uh, each row or a column has the process number appearing exactly once. So this way, you actually do well for both the matrix vector multiplies. Uh, so you get both load balance. So let's say for the first uh, matrix vector multiply, you'll go this way, right? You have parallelism along the, uh, along the columns. So you have one processor, and then you go each step this way. And now when you want to get parallelism across the rows, you also get parallelism across the rows because uh, you have different processors working in parallel here. And then there is some communication here, and then you go to the next. OK, so if you distribute it this way, you get, so the, what I want to emphasize here is if you do not follow a library-based approach or try to do manu trying to get this manually is also quite difficult. But a compiler that has some kind of a model, a code generator that has some model on communication, it's possible to derive this mapping automatically. So there is work on deriving such mappings automatically. You'll be able to determine uh, the right mapping. Remember that at this point, we haven't changed the algorithm. It's the same algorithm, but it's a different way to map the computation onto process that minimizes uh, communication. And you get basically order and communication. And this could uh, be a very, very significant reduction. And you can see good uh, scaling here. And so a compiler or a code generator that looks at all of these uh, operations and can select such a globally optimal layout for the entire program. And you cannot achieve this if you use uh, standard libraries that may just provide routines for each of those. OK, so, uh, so I also have some results. So, so these are the three uh, versions for the program that I showed. So this is the Sudoku uh, partitioning, where you actually have that Sudoku layout. This is just block cyclic. That is, you just take uh, and just divide it across. Uh, so it's slightly different from 1D row distribution, it's slightly better than that. And scalar pack is the the version, which is a sequence of uh, library calls, calls to highly tuned libraries. And as you can see, this is weak scaling. So it basically means as I increase the number of processes, I'm also increasing the amount of, uh, I'm keeping the problem size per node fixed. So the pseudo partitioning performs the best. So a flat line here is uh, ideal weak scaling. That is, uh, on 32 processes, you run 32 times the problem size in the same amount of time. OK, whereas. The other, other approaches, which have order n square communication, they, no, they don't scale well. Uh, once you start increasing the number of processes, uh, uh, the communication costs here just dominate. And so it's, uh, maybe sometimes it's better not to even do the layout trans uh, transpose and sacrifice parallelism uh, just to avoid that communication. Okay. So these results were taken on a, were collected on a 32 node InfiniBand cluster. OK, so let me now just quickly uh, uh, present an abstraction that will help us. Or maybe it will be useful in some domains. So I talked about compiler-based approaches. And uh, I'm going to present an abstraction that might be useful in certain uh, domains. That is, how do you actually derive such uh, mappings? Or how do you automatically come up with uh, data distributions? So uh, it's called the polyhedral compiler framework, and it's a convenient abstraction to reason about uh, and transform multidimensional computation and data spaces. So whenever you have big data, so you also have parallelism because you have loops that iterate over different uh, dimensions in your data space. So it basically means the application is going to have loops that iterates over data, and that also iterates, uh, performs several iterations in time. So. So it's sort of a, the polyhedral representation is an intermediate representation that can be used in a compiler. And it's, uh, it's, it's, an, it's mathematically convenient to reason about partitionings using the polyhedral framework. And there are lots of libraries and tools available. There's a lot of literature available. So briefly, so if this is your low level code, right? So this is what, for example, an assembler would produce or optimize. A slightly higher level representation is an abstract syntax tree, right? So this each bracket is a loop here. Okay. Uh, so this is a convenient representation that's used by many compilers. So something that can be uh, convenient and useful for big data could be uh, the polyhedral representation, where the dimensions of the polyhedra correspond to loops. So you abstract 
loops with the dimensions of the polyhedra. So here, if you have a three-dimensional loop nest, you can represent every iteration as a point inside this uh, polyhedron. Okay, and uh, so you have your execution is a collection of polyhedra, and you can reason about all kinds of complex transformations, data distributions. For example, if you want to divide, distribute it along this dimension, you can take a hyperplane and then slice it in this particular way, and then the orientation of the hyperplane will tell you in which way you're distributing your data. So it's columns or rows and so on. Okay, so I think I'm running out of time, so I'll go quickly here. So this framework can be used to, to represent computation, to transform computation in some ways, to map it, schedule it, and then finally to generate code, which is the most important thing. I mean, if you transform your code and uh, break it in different ways, uh, you need such a framework. And I'm going to show you quickly some examples. As I mentioned, uh, the hyperplanes uh, in this framework, they sort of capture how you partition uh, your iterations or how you partition your data and so on. You could have multiple hyperplanes as well. I'll show you an example. Uh, as I mentioned, locality is all about reordering computation so that you have as many operations performed on the data that you load into faster memory. And uh, for example, if you look at this 3D cube. So this is a three-dimensional loopness. If you have three loops, right, you can represent the execution by this cube. All the integer points inside this cube is what you want to execute. Okay? And then, uh, for some reason, because this space is huge, you want to actually divide it in some particular way. And you may want to divide it in some fancy way because it has some good properties. Maybe it's not valid to divide it in some particular way. Uh, in other ways, you can maybe do more, perform more efficient parallelization. So let's say if you want to divide it into blocks like this, which is like a cube, which is, has been tilted this way. And imagine this entire big cube to be comprised of these small cubes, right? So this is a standard tiling transformation uh, in loop, loop nest optimization. And this can be represented by, this shape can be represented by the vectors that are normal to these three hyperplanes. So it's 1, 1, 0, 1, 0, 1, and 1, minus 1, 1. These are the vectors that are normal to these faces. And so this matrix sort of captures this uh, transformation. And, and you can, the, the code can look extremely complex. And so for example, this is the code you start with. right? And then if you want to tile it into cubes like this, and then distribute these cubes across different processes, if you try to do this by hand, it will be extremely complex. So this is some automatically generated code. As you can see, the bounds are extremely complex, but performs uh, quite well. So, uh, so tools like this can be used to come up with very complex ways in which you can distribute your data, distribute uh, your computation. And, uh, and these kind of transformations might be useful for reducing communication. And in this case, it so happens that this has very good properties in terms of the amount of communication you would uh, perform if you, were to partition, uh, uh, if you were to partition your iteration space into blocks like this. Okay. Uh, but I won't go into the details here. Similarly, just like you tile computation spaces, you can also tile data spaces, because all your data does not fit in uh, your memory. And so if you take a small data tile here, so this, let's say, was your original layout. You can change it such that each tile is contiguous in memory. So it provides you better locality, reduces TLB misses. And uh, this is one way to do weak scaling. That is, uh, if you want. This, this might fit in your, uh, the main memory of one node, whereas this whole thing doesn't, do, doesn't fit. And while accessing this, you'll have good locality if you do this transformation into this 2D space of uh, tiles. OK, so let me uh, conclude uh, quickly. So on the dark side, so there is, uh, at least in my opinion, there's no special big data approach for programming. It's the same principles that we've been uh, using for high performance computing. It's just that uh, big data would provide, uh, just like Jayant mentioned in his talk, it just provides uh, new test cases, interesting test cases uh, for research that you probably were anywhere doing uh, to obtain a high performance or in high performance computing. Uh, as usual, as is well known, you need different languages. There's no single uh, approach that will fit all domains in big data as well, right? The communication characteristics are going to be uh, very different, so you will need uh, different kinds of approaches. Maybe some places libraries are going to be good. Uh, so in some places, you have to actually do manual C programming. Uh, in other cases, maybe someone will, will build a new language and a domain-specific compiler, give you the language and the compiler along with it, and that can beat everything. So, so there's no single uh, good approach. 
And if you want to get good performance, the good old principles of uh, trying to improve locality, reduce communication, and trying to optimize your single thread very well, those are, those are still uh, true. And you have to actually uh, do all of these if you want to get good performance and also reduce power consumption, right? make use of uh, single thread very well, and get uh, good uh, scaling. But on the bright side, we have, so big data will actually provide good test cases. Uh, for existing uh, parallel programming models, right? They can try it on uh, uh, bigger problems. And uh, more interesting is thing is, as I said, weak scaling is one of the strong driving factors for supercomputing. People need bigger machines because they want uh, they want to analyze bigger data and not to and not just to run the same thing faster. So in that sense, uh, so we have a new domain here that will actually give a boost to high performance computing. Uh, and finally, there are uh, lots of good uh, research opportunities for people doing uh, language design, uh, building compilers, runtimes, uh, tools, as well as libraries. I mean, uh, you can provide standard packages for routines that are commonly used. Uh, so MapReduce is already one such uh, example. And so there is a lot of uh, research that can be done in building uh, sort of domain-specific, right? uh, specific to certain domains in big data. Or, new languages, as well as provide the compiler and the runtime for it. And that can be better than uh, doing manually building applications, or better than library-based uh, approaches. So I think with this, uh, I'll conclude. And thank you for your We have time for a couple of questions. So the person who is going to ask the question can announce uh, his or her name, and then ask the question. You can also announce the organization you are coming from. Hi, uh, I'm Aditya. I'm from IIC. Uh, so going back to your Sudoku scheme, right? Uh, it's not clear how that would scale with the size of the data. Like, uh, how would you generate it? And if like the data size even increases by one, you'll have to. You can't reuse the existing matrix, right? Okay. So, so the Sudoku mapping, what it really does is, if your data size increases, right? It still uh, it provides you a order dimension. So it, from order n square communication, you have order n communication. So as the size of the data increases, right, you may still have more communication, but it's still better than other mappings. My question is about generating the scheme itself. Oh, to generate this code itself. Yeah. Oh, that is quite uh, straightforward, because it's not very hard to express this mapping. right? So if you have rows and columns, right? Yeah. so just like, uh, so let's say if you have row number r, right? And if you have p processors, you just do uh, r modulo p, right? And then you, it, it gives you where to put the row. And so it's just a very simple uh, shift that you actually do. So specifying this mapping is not at all a problem, and it can be extended to 2D, 3D also. And uh, as long as uh, the number of, it, this is a perfect Sudoku mapping, but let's say if you have more rows than the number of processors, there might still be some load imbalance, but uh, it's still better than uh, doing those. One more question. Murali Krishna from CSA. So you j automatically generated uh, some code. Uh, this is during uh, s using static data, right? Uh, do yes. you have uh, any intuition on how you can do this uh, dynamically in, s in the sense that uh, can you make dynamic decisions on how to change? Ah, so that? one way to make dynamic decisions is basically have multiple versions of the code and select one of the versions of the code at runtime. That's one way, because this code is it's, it's extremely uh, complex, because there are lower and upper bounds for each uh, loop. So, and you don't want to add overhead, especially in the inner portions uh, here. Uh, if you want to make dynamic decisions, you can uh, do it here. But so far, I don't know of a case where you actually, uh, the only case that I know of where you make dynamic decisions is, you generate several versions, right? Like this, you have maybe a different transformation, you have another version, and then you have a condition that selects one of these. And so in that way, you can do. Uh, beyond that, I'm not sure how you can uh, add some more dynamic. Well, there are some specific contexts in which people have done dynamic analysis. And for example, for vectorization and so on, uh, they are not sure whether the vectorized code will give you better performance. So they have some checks on the top. Again, it's all about versioning as opposed to. But it's not really a very good approach because it really increases the code size. And so it's just usually they'll just use a model and select uh, one version. 
So in the interest of time, we'll take the other questions uh, offline. So let's thank uh, Professor Uday for a very nice uh, talk. And uh, actually request uh, Dr. V. Gopalakrishna, CEO of Integra Microsystems, one of our distinguished alumni, to give a small memento to Professor Uday. Thank you, Professor Uday. I now have the pleasure of introducing the next speaker, uh, Professor Vishwanathan. Uh, Professor Vishwanathan joined uh, the Indian Institute of Science as an undergraduate, undergraduate student way back in 1961, which is exactly 53 years back. And uh, during these 53 years, except for about 10 years, uh, he has always been at IISC. So at IISC, he has been a BE student, uh, an ME student, a PhD student, a lecturer, an assistant professor, associate professor, full professor, chairman of the department, divisional chairman of the division. And uh, after that, uh, he became the executive director of the Logistics, Logistics Institute Asia Pacific at Singapore, then came back to India became the executive director of the Logistics Institute at the Indian School of uh, Business. And uh, currently, he is INSA senior scientist at the department of CSA. Professor Vishwanatham is very passionate about <laughs> manufacturing, supply chain management, and service science, and a variety of areas. Currently, food security, agriculture, and topics like global villages and smart cities are also very close to his heart, and uh, he is a fellow of IEEE, a fellow of the World Academy of Sciences, TWAS. He is also a fellow of all the leading Indian science and engineering academies. And today he will be talking to us about uh, big data decision making in manufacturing supply chains. Over to Professor Vishwanathan. I would like to uh, thank uh, Professor Narhari and Shivani Agrawal for uh, giving me this opportunity uh, to share about my ideas about big data decision making and manufacturing supply chains. Well, this is, I think, the fourth time I'm giving uh, this kind of a talk, but not the same talk. And the first talk that I gave was CIOs at, uh, in Delhi. This was three years ago. And uh, I got an excellent rating at that time, and that's why it's because Everybody was talking about big data, and nobody knows what big data is. And the situation prevails even today. Uh, but um, let me try and see uh, how I can explain what it means to manufacturing supply chains. Why supply chains? It's because behind every product or service, there is a supply chain. You take a soccer ball, which you must be watching all the the 2014 supply chain is the soccer ball, where you know Brazil, lot of lot of things were being exported, and you know where the soccer ball is made: Pakistan, China, Argentina, and uh, and other places, and everything is distributed globally, and the, and it is finally sent. So when you enjoy the soccer ball match, please also bless the supply chain designers behind the ball. I mean, you take anything, your mobile phone, your uh, laptop, everything behind that, there is a supply chain. And if you say that the supply chain, or the product is not good, that means the supply chain is bad. So it's very important that you study and make your supply chain A, efficient, and B, quality conscious, and C, cost conscious. So let's look at how uh, database decision making uh, is applicable here. I mean, there is always data in supply chains. I mean, if you have worked in control theory, you use actuators and sensors. You measure the data using the sensors, use the actuators to control the actual kind of the system and so on. Even in supply chains, there was data being used for optimization for decision making and so on. So let's look at some of these things and then see 
how big data makes a difference. So I will give a very brief introduction of manufacturing supply chains because I don't know how many of you know about what is a supply chain. And second one is the changing phase of auto and logistics industries. Why auto? Auto is automobile industries. Because the automobile is the machine of the world. It is the machine that changed the world. In 1913, when Ford, Henry Ford has put the assembly line, that is the beginning of the industrial revolution, real industrial revolution. And all of us see whatever changes that have been made, the roads, the malls, everything is because of the auto. So that's what where, where we look at the changing phase. And this is where big data is being used. And I will mention a lot of startups which have come up in the auto and logistics industries, including in Bangalore. And of course, I'll then talk about what is called big data ecosystem. Everybody talks about big data. How do I, how do I design using big data? And what is the big data about? And if I'm making a decision, how do I make, how do I know what data to collect? And where do I collect it from? What are the resources? And so on. And finally, I'll give an example if there is time and conclude this lecture. So let's look at uh, the manufacturing supply chains. This is a manufacturing system. Well, you put material, labor, technology, and capital into this. I mean, technology nowadays in manufacturing is 80% of the productivity of a manufacturing system. And what you get out is quality product. Let it be a laptop or an auto. There is a lot of waste that comes in. And this is where sustainability is coming into picture. And there is scrap. Scrap is unavoidable. But in recent times, you have what is called 3D printing. I'm sure you must have heard about 3D printing, where you don't take a material and scrap it to make drill holes and all that, but you build from granules. And there are decisions that are to be made. What are the decisions? What do I manufacture? And what are the design criteria for this? And where do I sell it? How do I procure? Who are my suppliers? Who are my customers? How much do I manufacture? These are all the decisions that you need to make. And there are disturbances. These disturbances in olden days, when Narhari and I wrote the book in 1992, we were considering disturbances like failure of the suppliers, failure of a machine, and, and so on. But now the disturbances, they range from the government disturbances to the environmental disturbances. Like, for example, there is Iraq, there is a crisis going on. So the oil is getting affected. Oil price increase. That increases the transportation. That increases your supply chain. Now there is a change in the government in, the, in, in India. And immediately the government has said they have increased the export uh, import duties of sugar. So the sugar price and the export people have uh, supply chains got affected. So the disturbances, what used to be internal, now have become external. Now this is one factor that makes this whole manufacturing supply chains big data enabled. You need not, you should need, uh, need to consider only internal data. You have to consider external data, what is happening around the world, into the account as relevant to your manufacturing supply chain. So let, let us look at uh, this one. This is you know, manufacturing supply chain starts with suppliers. And there is an original equipment manufacturer. There is a distributor, retailer, and finally, the customer. And the suppliers are globally distributed. So they have to be, the material has to be transported from the supplier to the manufacturer. And you require what is called B2B logistics. You require trucks and other things to be to be transformed. And similarly, from the distributor to the retailers, there is what is called B2C logistics that need to be transported. And there is another thing that is from the customer. There is what is called the service center. There is a reverse supply chain that goes on. And you have to get the spare parts from the suppliers and have a service center. 
and the logistics basically takes care of that. So this is the supply chain which both forward and backward. And how many people are involved in this? There are the suppliers, there are manufacturers, there are distributors, retailers, logistics providers, repair and maintenance providers. These are all the, the conglomerate of the supply chain that you have. So if you want to map this, that's what it is. So you have the suppliers which are called tier one suppliers, and they source it from some others, and finally it goes up to the raw materials and it goes up to the mines. And similarly from the manufacturer you go to the distributors and customers and retailers and so on. So if you take an auto supply chain, there are about 15,000 companies which are involved in this. So as such, when you are studying manufacturing supply chains, it is big in terms of the numbers. And remember, all these people are globally distributed. Your mine may be in Australia, or it could be Indonesian coal mine, and your OEM or the power generator could be somewhere in Hyderabad and your customers could be somewhere else. So it is highly spatially distributed supply chain here, and there are a number of companies in this. Now, how do you coordinate this? Now, when you say a laptop, you know, you order a laptop, pay it through your credit card, and within 24 hours, it's delivered by Dell or somebody, or Flipkart to you. How is it that these things happen? Is it market-oriented, or is there somebody who governs the whole thing? So that calls governance of the supply chain, which is which I will not go into at this time. So what are the recent advances in this? There are what are called internets of things, and somebody I heard today, internet of everything. So, but internet of things is three things which are coming. One is tagging things for identification. You have a product, you tag it with an RFID tag, and it could be your luggage, which you, which you book into the, into the airline, and you tag it with an RFID tag, it can be, and you sense things, and you embed things inside the machines. And there, is, there are a lot of things that are happening in terms of uh, this one, cyber physical systems, systems of systems, and network of networks. You know, if you take any supply chain network, you have basically the goods flow, there is the information flow, which is there is an information network, and there is a financial flow. Unless the finances flow, nothing happens. So basically, the, these three are becomes a network of networks. So there is, a, as I said, the analytics 1.0, decision making internal data. There have been several things happening in the uh, supply chain arena where there are a lot of decisions which are being made. For example, sourcing. Where do, which country do I source the material from? Do I go to China, India, Australia, or Indonesia? Where is it? And from whom inside, the, inside that country? This is a big decision that is to be made. And it depends, as I will show you later, it depends on the taxes you have to pay, import, export duties, the government friendliness, the logistics, that is to be applied on several other things. And you have to use the demand estimation. How much is, what is going to be the demand next month? What is going to be demand next week? How much are you going to keep? You want to keep the inventory here in, in the store and so on. How much to manufacture inventory levels at various places and so on. And you must have, I mean, I don't know how many of you work for these companies, ERP, that is, Enterprise Resource Planning, it is also called SAP. APS, Advanced Planning Software, TMS. Transportation Management Systems, WMS, Warehouse Management Systems. These are huge, very expensive software packages that are available, make decisions, analyzing internal data. You take the sales, sales data, you take the shipments, in internal, etc., and tell you what to do next. Control using PLCs, programmable logic and controllers, robots, BPOs, etc. I'll give an example of a BPO later. And monitoring equipment for preventive maintenance using IoT. IoT is Internet of Things. Now, in earlier days, you used to repair equipment. So you used to schedule 
saying that every three months you send your bus or your truck for repair or your aircraft engine for repair. But nowadays, you can actually use the sensors to find out what is the health of your, your machine. So there is a lot of monitoring equipment that is, that is using. So all this is using internal data. So there is a lot of optimization and other algorithms that are available, which have been used under the heading of operations research and so on, where you get this analytics 1.0. But what is the next? In other words, where does big data come in? I am already using this sales data and other kinds of things. So the next big thing is the big data. And one thing is to show if you want to see if anybody is working with the software industry, you can see that these are all the packages that one uses in the supply chain and they're all interconnected. Although they don't share the data, the WMS doesn't give what is the warehouse data to some other people. They're all, but they are connected. And all this, what happened was, in the year 2008, all of us know there is a financial crisis. To make the systems more efficient, you have connected all the supply chains globally, making, you can source globally, you have interconnected them globally using internet and other kinds of things. But that has led to what is called synchronized trade collapse in 2008. 2008, what happened in September was there was a bank failure in the United States. And in the United States, there was a drop in the demand. Once there is a drop in the demand, then the suppliers were, everybody has canceled the orders to up to Chinese, Indian suppliers, and so on. So the logistics providers have no business. And the trade, 80% of the trade is basically goods trade, and 20% is, is software services. So it has become a 20% drop in the 2008-9, and still we have not recovered this. And everybody, so there is a lot of books, articles on this global trade collapse. Everybody blames the global supply chain for this. You have make, you've made your supply chain so efficient and so distributed, and so connected. Whenever something happens anywhere in the world, let it be a tsunami in Japan or a financial crisis in this one, the entire supply chain collapses. And the trade collapse has happened. This. Now what does this mean? This means that your supply chains are affected not only by your internal sales, this one demand and all that, but by something that is happening in the finance arena. How does, what is the connection between finance and, and uh, uh, the supply chain? It's an indirect connection. The buyers of the cars or any other equipment, they are financed, given loans by the banks. So when the banks suffer, the demand drops. So these are the kinds of indirect, this one. And a lot of governments which allowed uh, people to uh, start companies and outsourcing. They said they become protectionist. So because of all these reasons, there is a lot of big data which is coming into this, which is outside of the supply chain, which is affecting your supply chain ultimately. And the risk analysis is one of the big data topics in the supply chains in this. So I mean, if you, if you try to uh, look at, uh, analyze, what are all the things, if I want to systematically analyze a supply chain, there are four processes. One is procurement. You have to procure all the equipment. And you have to basically manufacture whatever, put all the things together, manufacture. And you have to distribute. And you have to service. These are the four major processes in here. And all these things are affected by the big data. What is big data? It is, I'm distinguishing between internal data is an internal to the supply chain. Big data is external environment. That is the governments, the resources, oil price increases, labor uh, costs, and so on and all that. So you will find that the distribution and retail 
and service chains are the most affected by the big data in recent times. And in the manufacturing, IoT, the Internet of Things has affected the manufacturing. It's becoming what is called cognitive manufacturing. In other words, in olden days, the manufacturing supply chain is you have various machines and somebody, some human being used to run the parts around the machine, around the factory floor. But now, each machine has embedded in it something. So the machine says, look, I cannot process this part. It takes eight hours of tooling. I have only four hours. After four hours, my tool fails. Or a part can say, look, I am needed urgently by my, my aircraft, so I'll pay you three times. Just get me out as fast as possible. So it can auction itself. So that is cognitive manufacturing is happening in this. So let me, let me show you some of the uh, big things that are happening using big data in, the, in these processes, in the examples which are changing this one. Auto industry, one thing that is happening in the auto industry is, I mean, till year 2000, people were not worried about using resources because they thought using technology, they can make resources more and more efficient. But you will find your food prices are increasing, the petrol prices are increasing, and this kind of resource increase is unstoppable unless something happens here. If you look at your car, it's the second biggest expenditure that you make after your house. It is parked 96% of the time. And the rest, 4%, you, uh, you use for parking, waiting for traffic lights, and 2% 2, 2 in driving, right? So why have a car? And auto is the machine that changed the world, as I said before. And good drivers are in a minority. Millions of accidents and deaths a year, and 33% of drivers did not even touch the brake at the time of the accident. They didn't even try to break at the time of the accident. So, anti-collision technologies face liability. In other words, supposing you have anti-collision technology, and then you know, still the accident happens, whom are you going to blame? Now, for that reason, the anti-collision technologies didn't come. So, there are several applications which are startups which have come in. You must have heard of Zipcar. And Avis bought it for 500 million. You must have heard of Uber. I mean, this is Ubering is taking place. Let's people summon a car and a driver using this one. Google invested 258 million. MGADI, this is a Bangalore app. app you can call auto rickshaw or uh, pay by paying 10 rupees in this. And UberX in Bangalore, Delhi, and Hyderabad, it competes with all of cabs and taxi for sure. And relay rates and get around provide marketplaces where one can rent. You can rent your own car. And stuff it's sitting in the in this one, you can rent in the United States your own car. So that is also coming. And Indrex gathers location information from millions of cars and it tells you, look, you know, there is a lot of traffic on this new BL road. Go on the other the other side. So these are kinds of apps, apps which are coming, and BMW and Daimler say they are transport companies. They are not car manufacturers anymore. So there are lots of apps are coming. And these are services to the auto industry, which will eventually affect the auto industry. So real deal intermediation is happening. If you are talking of uh, you know, in the year 2000, then people were wondering when the internet came into existence, people thought there will be disintermediation, all the media, middlemen will be this one. But real disintermediation is happening now. Uber for logistics is happening in Asia. Gogo van and EG van provide peer to peer applications that connect van drivers to the individuals. You want a van to transport something, then this is in Hong Kong. You can, it connects them to you. And trucking firms use data from new sensors, monitoring fuel levels, location, and capacity, driver behavior in their optimization. This is the external big data that you use. In olden days, how do you optimize? How do you choose route for your truck? Based on the distance, right? 
and the roads. But now, you look at, you monitor the levels, location, capacity, driver behavior, and so on. And the goal is to improve the company's route network, low fuel costs, and decrease the accidents. Uber is not a car service, it's the future of logistics. And I'll give you one example where uh, this one, there is a, I'm, I'm sure you must have heard of a company called Genpack, right? It's a BPO. It's, uh, I mean, it has offices both in Delhi and Hyderabad. And Tensky is a logistics service. It's a service provider, uh, transports auto components from anywhere in the United States to Detroit. Now, the Genpack BPO workers in India and Mexico checks customer status. Supposing somebody wants something, the customer status, assign trucks and drivers. There are 30,000 trucks. Which truck goes from where to Detroit? From which company? Who is the driver for that truck? It's all done in Hyderabad. So assign trucks and drivers. If truck gets stuck at a way station for some reason, then the credit card is swiped in Hyderabad for the, for the money. And after the trip, driver's log is ship it to Genfax facility. What does this mean? There are so many things that are happening in the control even when 30,000 trucks going from all over the US towards Detroit. And from the suppliers to the manufacturers, the scheduling, the drivers depending on their availability, their needs, and the trucks depending on their uh, uh, maintenance uh, this one, how much distance they can travel without failing. Taking all this into account, Genpack does this in real time. So it is not just an optimization problem, but it is using all the kinds of data in real time. They use the BPO to make real time decisions. So Penske processes a lot of information. Numerical, text, voice, past records of 15K trucks an equal number of drivers. A mobile app in India is a need. It's not done, it is done by BPO, but if somebody can do this. But of course, you must have heard of uh, the driverless cars by Google. Now, uh, Google's driverless car are licensed to operate in California, and it has driven 700,000 miles without an accident. They use 360 degree sensors, lasers, learning algorithms, and GPS, all artificial intelligence and so on. I think it would be very nice if some of you can learn what these algorithms are and what are these sensors and get to the bottom of this because it becomes very important. I'll tell you why. Cars should be managed as a network of the future. It's not you sitting in the driving seat and driving. When the car is automated, each car is controlled by the network. All the information that the car sees or the sensors see, it goes into the network. So like our communication network, seven layered protocol, you have to have the road network has to have a protocol of this communication network that needs to be developed. And then only driverless cars become this one. Nissan and Daimler are committed to driverless cars by 2020. And Rio Tinto, Rio Tinto is an Australian company, which is a mining company which does uh, mining of uh, this iron ore. And they have driverless trucks moved 100 million tons. So we know that we hear from the TV and all that, a lot of things happen in the mines. So if you want to have driverless trucks, you create, you, you eliminate accidents and human deaths. Huge implications in social, industrial, and military sectors. So the military, I mean, I'm sure these things have not come, come out in the open, but in the US and other militaries, things must have been happening much more than what comes out. And in fact, one of the big data companies from Boston 
uh, which Google has. This one has, it can read all the newspapers of all languages. You tell them an item, and they say if you are, if you are looking at terrorists, you need to read the newspapers from some of the regions where the terrorists originate from. It's not enough if you read a Bangalore Deccan Herald or a New York Times. So they basically say that you have to, you have to get into several of these details into this. But another th big thing that is happening is in the area of service maintenance and repair. 75% of power plants run on natural gas, coal, and nuclear using big data analytics. Aircraft can tell maintenance crews the status and which parts need replacement. I was working for, uh, uh, when I was in Singapore, I was working for uh, the shipping company. And they wanted, they, when we, you take your own car or anything, you replace these parts, you don't know when you have replaced, what is the age of the replaced part. The same thing happened for the ship. So they don't know which one, what is the age of, remaining age of the, uh, these parts they have. So they have put RFID tags and RFID readers and so on. So GE can predict failure of gas turbines weeks in advance. They have on the fans, turbine fans, they have put sensors. And I mean, these are all technical details. One has to go into this, how it happens, and so on. A shift from current practice of maintenance being carried out on a set timetable or reactivity. In other words, you say every three months, I will just uh, or take the truck, or send it for repair, or the aircraft engine for repair. Instead of that, you take it when it fails, when it's about to fail. And G invested 105 million in Pivotal. Pivotal is a big data company formed by EMC and VMware. Both of them are in Bangalore. So retailing is uh, another thing where disruption are taking place. Retailers watch shoppers. I mean, this is where all of us have to be careful. As you are moving around the retail shop, they watch in the store where they go, in what order, and understand how all this map onto sales. And recommender systems suggest to the consumers products based on their browsing, searches, and earlier purchases. This is Netflix or another kind of things, they, they suggest this. And recommender systems is a big uh, uh, topic on their workshops that are conducted. Netflix use recommender systems for each subscriber. In other words, Netflix is the movie. Uh, uh, this one, depending on your previous uh, movies, this one, if a new movie comes, uh, you know, they will, they will tell you, oh, this is a romantic movie, like what you have watched earlier, so you may want to watch it, and they recommend it. And target predicted pregnancy in a teen based on the buying patterns. If you are using your credit card, your loyalty cards, then that is the source for finding out what you are buying and why you are buying. Your, she was buying vitamin, calcium enriched vitamins, which are used by pregnant women. And what Target did was they sent baby shower coupons to their family. And the father said, look, what the hell, you know, my daughter is only 14 years, and why are you sending these coupons, and so on. So he didn't know his daughter is pregnant, but Target knows. So this is a big story in the New York Times uh, one year ago, and so on. So recommender systems suggest this. And Focus is shift from sales and marketing. Retailing is not just sales and marketing to predictive analytics, using industry knowledge, consumer preferences, connections with total social media analytics, and so on. So this so-called big data is all this is all big data. You are not using earlier this big data. You are using what people have bought earlier. Uh, last week, what are the sales? and what are going to be the sales next week. Believe me, you may pay a lot of money for SAP and ERP packages, but they just do whatever 
is solved last week, they will just use it in the next week. If you want, you can go to SAP and ask them and so on. They don't use any of these analytics into this. So there is going to be need to need for a changing of this and so on. So privacy is at stake in all this, and particularly when you're using royalty cards and credit cards. And if you have a corporate credit card, be extremely very careful what you buy. And it is also, you know, Monsanto is a big agriculture company. It acquired Climate Corporation for 930 million. And what are the implications? Why are we talking about all this? Demand for services, not just products. It's the power by the hour. In other words, I don't know how many of you know, the aircraft engines are not manufactured by the either Airbus or uh, uh, Boeing. They are manufactured by Rolls-Royce or GE or somebody. An aircraft engine is paid when it flies in the aircraft. When it is in the aircraft, an aircraft is flying. If the aircraft is not flying, or if it is this one, they don't pay for the aircraft engine. So it's basically the maintenance of the aircraft engine. It's called power by the hour, and so on. New services such as information networks and protocols for roads and control of traffic are needed before driverless cars become this one. Happening in mines and military already. So, I mean, I have five minutes. Chiru has shown me his hand. so. In that, I'll tell you <laughs> the following. Big data should aid in decision making that results in desired business outcomes. We are talking of a manufacturing supply chain. What is the desired business outcome? What is the most desired business outcome? What marriage of data and algorithms gets us there? Big question. What data from suppliers, customers, governments, local economic environment should one collect and analyze? What data I analyze every day, every week, and every month? So let me answer this question. A framework is needed for this. So I have a framework called Big Data Service Chain Ecosystem. And this, it has four components. One is the service chain of the big data. I'll tell you what it is. And the resources needed for this, and the institutions no data is free from either the, the government regulations. There are always regulations. You cannot share my health data with somebody else. You cannot, no company gives you the supplier data or their uh, warehouse data or ERP data with another company. So there are always rules and regulations associated with this. And how do you want to deliver this service? So let's look at it. So you have basically control action. What is the action you want to do? You want to have a driverless car, or what is that you want to do? So you have to identify the content, you have to acquire the content, you have to data marshal, clean the content, and analyze it. And what are the regularity bodies that are associated with this? Legal license and privacy issues, central state governments, citizen groups, and business organizations associated. And of course, you have human resources with new skill sets. Because that's all big data, I mean, everybody was talking about it. Cloud and other storage resources. Where do you store all this data? And software clusters, social media, R&D and education institutions, wireless and smartphone service providers who can provide whatever apps that you need. And how do you deliver it? to AI-based decision support systems, or BPO, or decision-making tools, you know, to have feedback and correction and communication tools, and so on. So basically, if you are trying to solve any big data problem, you should get into this. Once you have the map, it will give you a one-page big picture of what you want to, what you, what you want to do in this. So I mean, for the procurement, I will Usually, I will skip this, but uh, usually you do what is called uh, 
strong ties with trusted suppliers. So I so I'm sourcing from my grandfather's time, so I will source it from these suppliers. Or everybody is sourcing from China, so I will also source from China, these kind of things. But they don't do the big terror. And also the total landed cost. Focus on supplier ecosystem, not the price and quality. You have to look at the entire ecosystem. For example, if the supplier bank fails, then the supplier fails, and you don't have the supplier, you cannot make your product. So, if the, so basically, you have to look at the entire ecosystem of the supplier and so on. So let's conclude. Our framework identifies the data to collect and analyze to make the needed decisions. Data formats need to be standardized for GG collection. Now everybody says the data, data, and so on. What is the format? It should be analyzable. So nobody knows. I mean, uh, Mahalabis has done this great service to this country by having the data formats for the planning commission. But things have changed so much so from since then. Nobody has done uh, anything after that. And attention is needed for creating apps for disintermediation. One example is Indian truck market. 80% are owner, single truck, owner drivers. And they are connected through middlemen. Is it possible to have an app? And similar is true for SMEs. Everybody says that, oh, SMEs are not doing well. They're committing suicide and all that. Is it possible to connect all the SMEs? And the same thing is true with the farmers, commission agents, traders, industries. And as a social network, if you have the money, is it possible to have an app which connects the farmers with the mundies and others and so on? These are a few examples applicable to service value networks and public networks such as infrastructure, public health, food security, and so on. Now, everybody talks of talent. There is no talent. But in India, there is one problem. There is talent, but it is working on others' problems. You have Microsoft, <laughs> works for US. You have IBM, works for something. You have Mu Sigma, work for somebody else. So. I think attention to Indian problems is the need of the hour. I was suggesting to somebody some 10 years back that IT companies in India should do at least 20% for the SOPs they get on Indian problems. But anyway, that's the, this one. I just want to show uh, one slide with your permission of this. And, and of course, this is what you, uh, you were asking me, do you have a book? And uh, this is a book which came in 2013. Uh, it gives the ecosystem framework. It has lots of examples which you can use. It doesn't deal with big data, but uh, it's a book by me and Kamishar. You know, if you look at uh, uh, the innovations and the big data in this, the biggest innovation that has happened in this world is the Suez and Panama canals. That has improved the, the, the trade and the connectivity so much. And you can see that from here, the Suez Canal has saved uh, so much from 16,000 miles to uh, 10,000 miles. So 6,000 kilometers it has changed. And if you look at the, uh, the Panama Canal, it has 21,000 to 8,000 kilometers and so on. Of course, you can see the big data here that the Suez Canal has created Somali pirates there were offshoots of this. And that has increased the, uh, the other things associated with this. Now, here, uh, the, the point is the unconnected things with I mean, the manufacturing supply chain like this get affected. And there is one thing which worries me is that's happening. China wants to build a road line to USA. It's 13,000 kilometers. It goes through the Bering Strait to in the, uh, this one, and from through Russia, through Alaska, to Canada, to, to the US, and across Siberia and pass under Bering Strait through 200 kilometers tunnel. 
200 kilometers. I mean, this is going to be the big, big data thing that uh, given requiring government permissions and all the kinds of new technologies and all that. I think one lesson that we should learn from this is, in India, we have the infrastructure problem for building roads. I think we can take some of these lessons and then see what we can do for this and so on. And another example I can say where big data has failed, I'll, I'm done, is big data Malaysian Airlines, MH370. It left on March 8th, right? Yeah, 8th March. And you can, you can uh, say big data on MH370, then several teams have this one, but they couldn't find it. So thanks very much on this. Indeed, it's been a very visionary talk. So we have, I think we are out of time, but time for maybe two questions at most. So I see a hand. Please Bit introduce yourself. Yogesh Simon, SCRC, IISC. Bit of a provocative question. So Uday concluded by saying there's nothing much to new and big data, it's just HPC redux. Well, you paint a very optimistic future. I, mean, I wanted your comment, maybe you know that, is on where the reality lies. <laughs> Sorry, I didn't. So I don't know. I didn't understand his question. So I think, I think uh, to, to, if I summarize your question correct, our previous speaker said, uh, oh, big data is nothing new. You know, we know how to solve it. Uh -huh. it's just this, you know, uh, it might be a little challenging, that's all. That's all. Whereas you are saying that, no, no, big data can change the way we do things. That's right. So he's saying that probably, like, where's the truth? Well, the truth is that big data really changes the way you have to think. Because, you know, all the new apps, that you use. If you are sourcing uh, in olden days, for example, you look at uh, only the cost and so on. Now you have to look at the government. You have to look at uh, uh, the oil prices. You have to look at there is going to be a war or there is going to be a tsunami or something. So because you can analyze, you can use that to reduce the risk of your, your this one. So I mean, certainly, uh, I mean, it is the way you look at it. If you integrate the big data, which I am defining through my ecosystem, as an ordinary data, then there's nothing new. But uh, the most of this uh, data that comes in is not numerical. It, it comes as a text. It comes as opinions. It comes as predictions and so on. So it, it really makes, uh, where, I, where I was using optimization, I had to use AHP, I had to use, uh, you know, some yeah, missed, uh, expert systems and so on and all that. So the methodology changes. But the fact that uh, you have taken all this into account and, and, and did it, that will help you in the future. You know, supposing some ch changes. This, because any, anything that you do is, is a decision. And the decisions, you make a decision today and you have to monitor it. And when you monitor if something changes, then you know what to do and so on. So basically, it's important. I, 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 am, I feel that the big data has so much to this one. I mean, here is Nilesh Sinha, who is uh, from Procam Logistics. He uh, probably, what his company does is to, uh, you know, supply the rail coaches, bring them up, uh, and, and also supply the boilers and other kinds of things to, to various industries. And he faces uh, uh, these kind of problems from the governments when he crosses the state to state and so on. So it's very important for businesses to look at the big data and define what the data is and so on. So. OK, time for one last question.
Uh, that's one of the, that is what I'm saying. You, you should see what the control action is. So, I mean, I'm, all I'm saying is M has 370 with the, so many people working, lakhs and lakhs of people working, and using all the kinds of techniques, technologies, and uh, big computers people are using. They couldn't find it. So, I'm not saying anything against big data, but it's one of the failures. Okay, I think we are out of time. So I, now I'll invite one of the most illustrious students of Professor Vishwanathan, our chairman, Professor Narahari, <laughs> to present a small gift. So we would like to, as from behalf of CSA department and the Big Data Initiative Group, we'd like to thank all of you for attending most of the talks. So with this talk, we will end the first series of talks. Uh, we hope to announce a new initiative, which will be again, maybe talks, maybe other workshops, et cetera. So hopefully, we'll come back to you with more information around maybe sometime next month. In the meantime, all these talks are uploaded in YouTube. I guess big data at CSA is the link. Please feel free to uh, see them. And for now, coffee is outside.